I thought it would be useful to uh, start off by explaining why uh, the Academy has taken up this subject of human security and give you a little history some of you are familiar with, and I would like to acknowledge in the beginning that our Latin American uh, fellows have played a, a, a key role in the steps that we have taken in order to get to this point uh, on a project on human security. Uh, back in 2013, the Academy partnered with the United Nations in Geneva on a project ambitiously called a new paradigm for human development. And the context for that project was the global, the multidimensional global challenges that were confronting humanity at that time, which, if anything, have only multiplied in number and increased in intensity since then. And we thought we had our hands full at that time. And we discussed during that conference, we had about 200 diplomats and uh, members of, uh, of universities, research institutes, uh, uh, NGOs, and, and government, of course, uh, involved, that the increasing speed of change, the increasing intensity and magnitude of the challenges we face, these multidimensional challenges, political, economic, social, cultural, ecological uh, challenges uh, that we face, with increasing complexity, uh, increasing uh, inter interdependence between the issues, it was becoming more and more difficult for us to handle them because none of them could be handled in isolation from the others. In fact, one of the main criteria or characteristics of these challenges was, was none of them could be effectively handled by nation states on their own because it would, they all required a certain amount of global cooperation and global coordination beyond the level that the multilateral system or the nation states had been accustomed to dealing with in the past. This was uh, six years after the 2008 financial crisis, and we were still dealing with inflationary problems and employment problems and financial uh, and banking problems and so forth. As, as well as many others. As a result of that, uh, the Academy embarked on uh, several new lines of, of, of work. One of them was on the need for new economic thinking. Uh, and in fact, that particular project really had one of its earliest uh, uh, events in Brasilia, uh, which was hosted by our friends at the UN here in Brazil uh, on the need for new thinking in economics for what we call the human-centered theory. Since then, we had, after that, we had four more international colli colliquia uh, on this topic, one in Gainesville, in Lisbon, in Cape Town, in Paris, where we tried to develop the lines of thinking for this. And most of those on this call were, many of them were present in uh, in all of these meetings. Another line of development at that time was the conclusion that we really needed some radical change in our educational system, that not only we needed new thinking in economics and in governance and security, but we needed new teaching and new ideas to prepare the next generation to be able to more effectively address uh, the challenges in an increasingly complex, more rapidly changing world. And that led to the launching of our sister organization, the World University Consortium, uh, with a conference at UC Berkeley in California, and then a second one at Roma Tre in, uh, in, in Rome, Italy. And then the third one was again back to uh, Brasilia. Uh, where we had an international, a large international conference with UNESCO and participants from all over Latin America, followed by another one in uh, Belgrade, and then two of the last two having been held online, the last one just last month, uh, actually. Uh, that was followed. I'm trying to trace a line of thinking so that the, the topic we come to today, you can see the logic that led us 
uh, to, to what we're doing today. Uh, in 2019, the UN office in Geneva invited us back, not just for a conference, but for a one-year project which we called global leadership in the 21st century. Okay, we've spoken enough about the problems. We understand the problems, but what are we going to do about them? And how are we going to manage them? And what is it we need to do differently than we're doing up until now? And how can we overcome the, the limitations of the existing, the prevalent multilateral system uh, in order to broaden the base of participation to address these issues because it was becoming increasingly obvious, apparent uh, to many of us that uh, national governments alone and multilateral institutions alone would not be sufficient to address issues that affect virtually all of humanity and actually require the support and, and involvement of humanity. And it was at that first of the meetings we had in Geneva that we raised the issue of human security and looked at a, a, a different concept of security, a shift in focus. It was quite clear that we were just, by that time we were in the middle of the pandemic, and it was quite clear that military problems and war were not the only sources of serious uh, threats to humanity uh, at a time which we hadn't yet foreseen what was gonna happen uh, 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 in uh, Ukraine uh, just shortly after that. Uh, but we saw we have global challenges of, that threaten the security of people all over the world, have shut down our educational systems, have stopped production, have uh, raised unemployment, have uh, limited uh, movements of food and other things that are threats to people all over the world. Uh, and this we also had by this time already been seeing, and the UN was very well aware, that we were losing pace in our targets on the, the 17 sustainable development goals, that uh, we had started out with very ambitious goals in 2015, uh, and I think very important, unprecedented time in history when 193 countries have come together unprecedented and agreed on an agenda uh, and 169 targets that we should address. And all of these targets directed at enhancing the security of people around the world in all countries around the world. It was the first globally coordinated effort covering virtually every sector a main sector of global society. It was unprecedented. So it's not surprising that uh, our ambitions may have exceeded uh, our initial performance. But the question that we put before us in Geneva was, what can we do to change that? What can we do to uh, overcome the limitations and obstacles to implementation and accelerate the process of uh, implementation for the target of uh, Agenda 2030, which was to achieve by 2030. We also began work on looking at uh, the financial requirements and the need for stimulating greater uh, financial resources and channeling them into the SDGs, not just the money to be generated by governments, but by the private sector and the banking system. And at the first of those uh, conferences, uh, uh, we had a very important discussions on how those finances could be redirected. At the second conference, our partners and now a, uh, a, a, research, uh, a, a research center of the academy, Force for Good, headed by one of our board members, Katan Patel. I'm sorry, Katan could not be uh, with us today, had just released or at, actually at our conference, he, they released their first report, a report of about 60 of the top banks in the world on how they were directing resources and how much of those resources were really going into uh, support for the SDGs and what could be done to try to augment the amount of resources going into the SDGs. So finance was a, a critical uh, element of this. Uh, at the uh, subsequently, uh, 
just more recently, actually in, in, in January, and I hope uh, Walt Stinson will talk to this when he comes around, uh, uh, the Force for Good released their fourth report, three had on finances, the fourth one on what technology could do to accelerate and address uh, the shortfall in the SDGs. Uh, one of the things that came very apparent to us was that we had to increase, not only us, but to the UN and to uh, all our partner organizations, that increasing the participation of global society was absolutely critical to that. And it was at that time we were invited by the Human Security Unit of the United Nations Trust Fund in New York to explore with them the possibility of launching a global campaign on human security for all. And it actually involved about two and a half years of discussion to really plan out what type of campaign we would need and what were the objectives of that campaign. And the primary objective was really to project the fact that we can't expect governments or multi and or multilateral institutions to pull the whole weight on implementation of the SDGs. We required the active participation of all sectors of society. And in framing the approach for the human security campaign, uh, we included business, faith-based religious organizations, educational institutions, parliamentarians, environmental groups, uh, amateur radio, all of which I hope Walt will uh, speak something to when he comes, journalists, social media, the, the, meat, the cinema industry, the arts, and of course, youth. And the purpose of this campaign, which we launched in January, was really to see how far we could take the essential message of Agenda 2030, of the SDGs, that says we meet, we as humanity as a whole, we confront unprecedented challenges. But together, if we can work together at the global level, we have the capacity to meet these challenges. But we're going to have to change a lot of things. We're going to have to change the way the multilateral system works. We're going to have to change the way our financial uh, resources are used. We're going to have to change the orientation of business and education uh, and virtually and, and civil society as well. And we launched the campaign with the view of talking about what changes were needed and how it could be done. And essentially, the goal was an accelerated transformation of global society. Sounds very ambitious, but we've already come a long way uh, in, in creating that awareness. We have to look at what's missing, what the blocks are, and how we can introduce catalytic strategies to overcome those limitations. And that's the purpose for which we launched this campaign uh, in January. The re initial response has been quite dramatic uh, and quite exceeded our original expectations, and I must say those of the UN as well. And this is a, a, an experimental effort in the sense we're trying to learn how the multilateral system and global civil society and all its partners can really work together in a more coordinated way uh, it's, it, it is a, a UN campaign, but it's really a human campaign. It's a, it's a campaign of, of humanity to work together to achieve our collective needs. The threats to human security since then have only increased. <laughs> the COVID problem, the war in Ukraine, and now and climate change, which is only growing in momentum, has made it clear uh, that the greatest challenge confronting us are no longer of national aggression. We still have it. We're seeing it, and we're seeing the calamitous results of it. But what's affecting everybody, these are challenges affecting everybody in the world. And we simply have to 
We need a concept of security that's no longer just the purview of military budgets and military and, and, uh, and military preparedness, but the whole society and the whole global society has to be more capable of addressing the issues that we collectively confront together and which none of us can be secure from. These are challenges that don't respect any borders. They don't respect class divides. Uh, they address, they impact all of us as they are doing even today. So this is a background for how we started and how and where we've come from. And for us, this is really just the beginning uh, for the us, for the when I say us, I mean for the World Academy and all our partner organizations that have been involved. It's just the beginning of trying to find new ways to engage global society in a collective, collaborative way to address challenges that are so great in magnitude, so vast in expanse, in reach, uh, that it requires a new way for us to work together. So with that, I'd like to uh, uh, introduce the first of my colleagues, uh, Jonathan Granoff, uh, who was one of the pioneers in the launching of uh, the human security uh, uh, campaign, uh, to talk to us about his understanding of what human security is all about and why it's so important. And Jonathan, I'll ask you just to say a few words about yourself and as a background, uh, introducing you to the uh, to the group. Uh, mucho gusto. Thank you. Um, I'm uh, a fellow and a trustee of the World Academy of Arts and Science. I'm the president of the Global Security Institute. I'm the representative to the UN of the World Summits of the Nobel Peace Prize winners. The only one we've, we've done two in Latin America, one in uh, the Yucatan and one to help President Santos. We did one in Colombia. Uh, to help end the, the, the Civil War with, uh, with I think we had 27 Nobel Peace Prize winners. And I'm presently also serving as the permanent observer of the International Anti-Corruption Academy, which is the institution created pursuant to the UN Convention Against Corruption. It's amazing. Nobody, nobody, nobody came forward and said, we're for corruption. How surprising. But uh, in any case, it puts me in the General Assembly with a diplomatic status. <clears throat> Human security as a term uh, arose from a brilliant analysis from a scholar named Mahbub al-Haq, an economist working in the UN Program for Development in 1994 when he queried, where is the peace dividend now that the Cold War has ended? We have gross disparities of wealth, we have endangering the regenerative processes of nature. We have global threats to the pollution of the ocean. And none of these can be met in an adversarial environment. The Cold War has ended. The money that should be freed up should be focused on addressing these threats that affect all of us. Particularly, he was very focused on poverty. And uh, this was while the world summits of the 1990s were taking place, the summit on habitat, the summit on the environment in Rio, of course, the summit on social development, and out of which emerged the sustainable development goals, the millennium development goals. The agenda that he was saying needed to be funded way back in 94, he identified it very clearly and said we need a change of thinking from the excesses of military nationalism. We need a framework to deal with the global threats that require cooperation, that are cross-cutting, that transcend national boundaries, like pandemics or the climate. And out of that emerged the concept of human security, that, that in, in the same way as we have different political approaches for cities, for, for counties, for states, for nations, for collections of nations, the European Union, et cetera, uh, uh, we need, or CELAC in your region, we need to have a perspective that puts human beings first and foremost. That needs to be cross-cutting. It needs to bring business in, politics, culture, 
etc. So um, when the pandemic took, uh, so I've been writing and thinking about this for a long time. In fact, I helped do a book with Mikhail Gorbachev and Senator Alan Cranston and Jane Goodall called The Sovereignty Revolution, f addressing very frontally the argument that any form of global cooperation diminishes the sovereignty of states. We argued exactly the opposite. The first duty of the state is to protect the citizens, and no state can protect its citizens from climate catastrophe at a national level, pandemics, etc. So when the pandemic came out, I wrote an article for uh, Newsweek, Newsweek magazine, uh, with a colleague, Barry Kelman, arguing that the pandemic is a time for a human security approach, that it can't be addressed by at, at a national level, that it's an opportunity. And in fact, I actually did research on how uh, polio and smallpox were dealt with, and they were dealt with in a global cooperative way. And they were and they were eradicated, virtually eradicated, two horrible uh, diseases for humanity. Um, and I was contacted by the Human Security Trust of the UN. They said, "You've articulated what we what we want to say to the world. We'd like to work with you." And I promptly and they thought I, that I should do it through the Global Security Institute. But the Global Security Institute, in my opinion, as um, as good as it is, and I'm the president of it, is not as deep in thinkers, in capacity, in vision, and uh, depth, really, as the World Academy of Arts and Science. So I immediately said, thank you, but I think that WAS should be a leader in this. Uh, for years, having studied the extraordinarily insightful publication, Cadmus and every day, and the various publications of WAS, I felt, well, this, this is, it's a much better place. So I brought that project to WAS, to Gary, and after arduous negotiations with a very dysfunctional bureaucracy at the UN, uh, WAS and the United Nations have partnered in a project called Human Security for All, the goal of which is to globally mainstream human security, putting human beings first, uh, as the UN Charter says, we the peoples through our nations, but let's focus on people. And that's pretty much the background and thinking as I see it, it may not be completely accurate, but it, what's important is it, it, brought, it brought us to a partnership with the UN to mainstream human security globally, and thus, <laughs> thus an appropriate gathering today. Thank you, Jonathan. That was a good opening statement for us, could help us position, and we'll come back to you. I, we have questions and like to hear much more. I'd now like to introduce Chantal Lynn Carpentier, who is presently and still for a few more days, the head chief of the office of UNCTAD uh, in the United Nations headquarters in New York, soon to be uh, promoted to a new position at UNCTAD in Geneva. Uh, uh, Chantal, please in, introduce yourself and share with us your thoughts. Uh, you're, you're speaking from inside the organization at a very high level where you've been working on the SDGs uh, you've been working in the sec with the Secretary General's office. You know what the challenge is for the UN in this and what it's trying to do to reach out. Uh, tell us from your perspective. Thank you so much, Gary. Bom dia, é um prazer estar com você hoje. Uh, fiz me pós-doctorado no Acre, Brasil. Então, uh, <laughs> Uh, it's a pleasure to be with you uh, as a WAS fellow and trustee to discuss the crucial issue of food security, as Gary mentioned, uh, which is one of the mention of human security uh, in the context though, of ongoing geopolitical, climate, environmental and food, fuel and financial crisis. Um, and in passing, mentioning the role of UNCTAD um, more than the role of the UN, because I can't speak for the UN itself. Um, so because of all these crises, the dimension of human security are getting even more interconnected 
And let me give you a few examples. Large increases in food prices we've seen um, following the, the, the pandemic and then the war in Ukraine increase economic insecurity, particularly for low-income households that spend a, a significant portion of the income in food, um, it, which impact the health insecurity as food insecurity and, and malnutrition, malnutrition lead to stunted growth and impaired cognitive development and increased susceptibility to disease, which in turn can reduce the lifelong earning potential of those affected, particularly for children. Which in turn <laughs> lead to social insecurity as people that can't feed their children will take to the street, raising social tension and conflict um, as we've seen during the Arab Spring and all recent food crisis. And in turn, this destabilized government creating more social unrest. And increasing extreme events affect agricultural productivity and food production, especially those depending on rainfall, um, and increase vulnerability and food insecurity of communities relying on agriculture for their livelihood. We thus need to find comprehensive solutions that address these interdependent vulnerability to food security as the global population grow, increasing the pressure on soil, um, and um, many, as Gary said, requiring international cooperation. There's some action that can be taken at the national level, but most at the international level. Today, about 2.4 billion people suffer from food insecurity, and as many people, uh, this is as many people that were living in the, on this planet after World War II, 2.4 billion people. This number has recently increased significantly because of rising food and energy prices and sustained inflation. In 2019, around 26% of the LAC population was classified as experiencing moderate or severe, severe food insecurity, meaning that they did not have access to sufficient food for an active and healthy life. The COVID-19 pandemic alone added about 150 million hungry people in 2021, and the war in Ukraine has added another 50 million people to that list. The Global Crisis Response Group created by the Secretary General Guterres uh, to, is, is aimed to addressing these amplifying effect of the Ukraine war on global food prices by bringing more than 8 million metric tons of grain out of Ukraine, including for humanitarian food assistance in partnership with the World Food Program to support the drought response in the Horn of Africa, for instance. Um, UN-led initiative has also helped to stabilize, this, this UN-led initiative has helped to stabilize and subsequently lower global food prices by moving grain from one of the world's bread basket to the table of those in need. And I'd like to say that for Latin America, we should all be proud. I consider myself in my heart, I'm a Latin American from Brazil, but <laughs> no, I'm Canadian. Um, we should all be proud that uh, this initiative is actually led by Rebecca Grinspan, former uh, vice president of Costa Rica and finance minister. And she's my boss and I'm privileged to have her as a boss. And she's leading that initiative for uh, SG Guterres. Um, and, and basically why we can say it has helped stabilize uh, prices. This is reflected in the food price index published by the UNFAO with prices of global food staple declining by about 8.6% in July last year, following the adoption of this agreement and 1.9% in August, another 1.1% in September, thus severely limiting food price inflation. Mm -hmm. However, the dependence of many developing economies, and this is less relevant for, Af for Latin America, but uh, particularly LDCs, on grain, they're dependent on grain import from Russian, the Russian Federation and Ukraine. And their subsequent vulnerability to the food crisis underscored the need to accelerate effort to foster investment in agriculture, especially in the European country. And this is also the case for Latin America. Um, because the food product, the agricultural productivity in Latin America uh, for similar condition is much lower than, is about 20% lower than the rest of um, similar condition. We need trade and other measures to transition towards sustainable and resilient supply chains. And on top of it, what, and this is where the international markets comes in play, the Federal Reserve increased its interest rate to combat inflation in the U.S., causing the U.S. dollar to appreciate 24% between May 2021 and October 2022, 24%. Now, for net food importing developing countries, the international market for food is a lifeline. But these countries face the double burden of high food prices and a depreciation of their local currency against the U.S. dollar. 
That means food import is even more expensive. And as it become more expensive to buy the food dominated in US dollars, it also become harder for these countries to prevent millions of people from going hungry. So now what is UNCTAD doing other than what our SD is doing uh, for the uh, Global Crisis Response Group? Um, as an organization dedicated to trade and development, UNCTAD has a unique perspective to link to look at the linkages between markets, trade, investment, and food security, um, advocating for policies to promote people-centered, resilient, sustainable, and equitable food system within the multilateral trade system. Uh, we uh, play, play a role in promoting food security by providing technical assistance to developing countries in areas such as agricultural trade, investment, and development policies. And we promote policy coherence amongst different sectors that affect food security. So, um, we also have a longstanding program such as BioTrade. Many of them started in, in, uh, in the region, such as Brazil, uh, in uh, Ecuador, and other, re and other countries as well as entrepreneurship for sustainable development that promotes sustainable use of biodiversity and sustainable agriculture, as well as market access um, to improve the livelihood of rural dwellers deepening that depends on natural capital. We also work on food uh, security to improve the productivity and competitiveness of small farmers um, and enhance the value addition of their product. A key concern we have right now is the possible effect of the higher price of fertilizer will have on future harvest. If farmer can no longer afford fertilizer this year, and many countries such as Brazil depend heavily on import fertilizers, but also many in Africa, then will, this will reduce the harvest next year, turning a crisis of affordability into a crisis of availability of food. We forecast for instances that in Africa, Fertilizer consumption decl will decline by between 18 to 23 percent. South Asia and East Asia will decline, the fertilizer consumption decline by 10 percent um, because of increase in prices of potash, um, phosphorus, and nitrogen or both. In Africa, this means there'll be a shortfall of at least 30 million metric tons of food, in particular wheat, maize, and soybean. Um, and of course, in Africa, they're more susceptible to these pre-existing low farm productivity, high share of fertilizer and production costs than the rest of the planet, um, as well as other issues, including a lack of investment in agriculture for the last few decades. Um, this means that especially smallholders are suddenly unable to afford the amount of fertilizer they normally use uh, because of the, the, the price increase, while their food that they produce is not seeing an increase in price at the farm gate because of the currency issues and the lack of competition in these markets, in these, in these countries. Just to give you an idea, fertilizer prices increased by 200% since 2020 in Africa, and it now representing 50% of production costs for those farmers. Um, there, but food security remain a challenge in Latin America. Um, as I mentioned before, affecting millions of people and highlighting the need for more sustainable, equitable um, uh, investment, but also social protection for. Um, so the United Nations is working to facilitate now export of Russian fertilizers to worst Western market. However, today this progress has been very slow. Uh, there are a lot of ship with uh, fertilizers that are stuck um, in, uh, in Europe that we're trying to repurpose and send to Africa for among other, other countries, other regions. Um, and there's a need to address the deeper root cause of food insecurity beyond these short-term short emergency. And we should take the opportunity of these crises to invest in the medium and long-term and address those. Um, true collective action. So let me offer a brief observation and suggestion. For instance, is water related event, um, too much or not enough water have become one of the major challenges around the world linked to these we extreme weather event. We need to consider whether there are new technologies that can help prevent or deal with drought. Many already exist such as drip irrigation, but we've not roll out those technologies to the farmers that need it the most. And in a sense, we need to polit stop politicking science and address the spread of misinformation on social media and others uh, and ensure that we get to see these technologies that are not taken from this, the, the science lab to the ground at a faster pace. 
We can also increase nutrient use efficiency using the so-called 4R, right source, right time, right rate, and right place, using the right information, satellite information connected to local um, data. Um, this re requires knowledge sharing and capacity building, increasing extension services as Af in Africa, for instance, as well as in the rural areas of, of Latin America, has great potential for the medium-term solution. Though, of course, in the short term, we're probably going to have to rely on um, assuring, ensuring access to um, affordable fertilizers to farmers. We also need to address the water, energy, climate, agriculture nexus um, that basically is affecting food security altogether um, to reduce greenhouse gases while increasing agricultural productivity. We have and ad adapt um, adaptation measures. We have the technology to do so. We need to make sure our small orders, our farmers put their hand on it at affordable costs. Um, we also, also need to increase access to market for our small farmers. So they receive fair product price. They receive something like three to 4%. Some of our so small orders receive two to 3%. Or for instance, in the coffee value chain, the cacao value chain, we need to readdress these value chain and, and have more transparency, uh, address the lack of competition in these market, especially in developing country, but worldwide as well, where farmers are price takers and they do not see the increase in international price. Some have also um, called for um, removal of speculation on um, basic commodities, agricultural commodities for which population depend on. We had on that also working on ensuring that there's no export ban on, on key agricultural commodities because many countries depend on trade to, uh, to access this food. Of course, in the medium to longer term, a lot of countries, especially the Caribbean, are investing in uh, their, um, in their uh, resilience in food production, wanting to increase, they have a program now to increase uh, local food product, regional food production in the Caribbean by 20% following what's happened because the Caribbean, of course, are, are affected also by the cost of delivery uh, of this uh, by ship, which went all, all, all up as well. Um, we also need to, to ensure that um, we increase investment and in research to reduce post-harvest losses. Um, which is now representing a huge amount of, uh, the, 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 of our food production. And we need to promote um, rural development. But in the short term, government will, will need with the international community to support a small order group that target them with um, safety net to compensate for production pro uh, lost. And social protection will probably need to be offered to vulnerable population to crash transfer, school meal, and food subsidies. We need economic model that advance the social, the environmental, and the economic dimension of the sustainable development goal. Right now, we have economic model that actually promote trade-off among the social, the environmental on the one hand, and the economics on the other hand. And these models do exist. The UN just published these briefs on new economics for sustainable development on the blue, the green, the purple, the orange the circular, the social solidarity economy. And these are all building blocks to new economics model that would actually advance social, environmental and economic uh, dimension at the same time. The UN in concluding, uh, Gary, is also working, we've just submitted to member state and, and actually Wednesday, the president of General Assembly is having a science um, briefing on beyond GDP. As long as we're going to measure success by GDP alone, not measuring how much we're actually extracting from our natural capital, our human capital, uh, and, and, and looking at the redistribution, um, we will not be making progress. We will continue having trade off and these alternative economic models cannot be supported because we only measure one of the dimensions. So this is something we're working on. Um, so in conclusion, food security is a critical component of human security, requir requiring at time tweaks and other and that others reform of our market, our trade and financial system. The UN is also under the Secretary General looking at reform of the international financial architecture um, that will then be able to deliver for all of us. Over to you. Thank you, Chantal. I think it, it shows 
how interconnected these issues are. <laughs> In one way or another, you've covered pretty much all of them and shown how interdependent they all are with each other. Wonderful. We'll come back. I have some questions for you uh, as we go further. Uh, and now our fourth speaker, I'd like to introduce Walt Stinson. Uh, he's a businessman. He's playing a, a key role in our campaign. And uh, Walt, please introduce yourself and uh, share your views on, uh, on what this campaign is about and what's important. Thanks, Gary. It's great to be here. It's always a pleasure to listen to Chantal and Jonathan uh, speak about human security and you also. Um, from my perspective, um, I'm really looking at what can WAS do to project the human security message out into the world. Um, it's one thing for us to be talking about it within WAS or within the UN even. It's another thing to actually get traction um, in the minds of the general public. And it's a very difficult problem. So that's something that I've been focusing on. Uh, for me, uh, getting my head around um, the human security concept has been um, interesting. It's been an exciting journey. Um, I see the um, SDGs as very much intertwined with the human security concept. Um, I see human security as the next step in uh, human evolution, societal evolution, in the sense that um, societal evolution has been a journey of uh, the people holding their governments responsible for their own experience in life. And it seems that the UN has come up with a paradigm of security that has the potential to hold our governments responsible for providing the context within which each individual can realize their full potential. So human security represents a new paradigm in security for me, and one that I think is critically important uh, for WAS and for the world to understand and to support. Um, so as I said, my role has been to take the human security concept and make it real in the world. And um, one of the ways that, uh, you know, in thinking about how to do that, we've realized that human security um, and the SDGs are objectives that can't be met by government. The budgets just aren't there to accomplish that. And so it's necessary to bring in civil society and the support of each individual to help provide the, the weight, the initiative the push to project human security out into um, in, into reality. And um, so uh, it, as we're facing a shortfall in the SDGs and the funding of the SDGs, we've overreached. We're not going to have the funding available to actually accomplish them. The question is how do we how do we get them? Um, realized in the world. And uh, it, it struck us that technology really is the answer to closing the gap in the SDGs, one of the answers. Um, there are, are, there's going to take, it's going to take more than just tech, but I think tech is really the, um, uh, has the potential to to close more of the gap than any other single source of energy of of wealth of of uh, of money and um, and so that's what I've been focused on. So I approached the Consumer Technology Association, which is the largest. Um, technology group in and, and puts on um, a, a large uh, trade event in Las Vegas called the Consumer Electronics Show that many of you have probably heard of because it's it projects its influence globally and every country sends reporters and manufacturers uh, to the CES show annually. 
Um, CES has about uh, 2,000 member companies. It attracts about 150,000 attendees and about five or 6,000 press. Um, so uh, last January, excuse me, about uh, 13 months ago, I approached them and talked to them about perhaps supporting the WAS campaign the, uh, the and the UN um, on the HS4A campaign with a, um, a theming of the show for, uh, on, along the lines of human security. And they agreed to do that. It's interesting that they agreed to do that because I think it shows that human security is a theme that can resonate outside of the NGO community. It can resonate outside the academic community and outside the the, the walls of the United Nations, which is, uh, I think, it was a, an eye-opening realization for those of us who've been uh, hoping that we might be able to gain traction with these concepts. Um, so uh, a, a, a team of WAS fellows and supporters went to CES in, uh, in January after about a year of planning. And um, we uh, put on uh, Great Mind sessions there um, that were filmed and attended by CES attendees. And we, um, uh, had a booth in the Innovations Pavilion, and we graded products that were submitted for Innovations Awards on their alignment with human security. And um, and we released a, a report on the role of technology in achieving these objectives called Tech as a Force for Good, and that was done by our partner organization, Force for Good, and Gary mentioned that earlier. That's led by Katan Patel, who's a trustee and fellow of the Academy. Um, the um, Several months after the conclusion of CES, we had a follow-up meeting where we evaluated the impact of CES and its success from the eyes of the exhibitors, the attendees, and uh, the evaluations done by CTA, and from the WASP side and the UN side to determine whether or not we really got bang for the buck. And the outcome of that evaluation was that CTA wants to theme the 2024 show, which happens to be their 100th anniversary. Um, they want to theme it on human security for all as well. So I think that's a, a, a huge endorsement uh, for WAS. I think it's a, it was a wake up for the, the uh, human security unit um, and perhaps others within the UN who um, could see with their own eyes um, the um, impact that can be made when you bring in an entire sector of industry in support of the human security for all concept. And um, it certainly was an exciting moment for those of us who poured our heart and soul into, uh, into making that event a success. So following up on that, we're, um, we're focusing on um, other events, what we've uh, developed is a formula, which is to take impactful um, events, uh, whether they are art events or um, or trade events or whatever, and leverage um, HS4A into those events and take advantage of the uh, organizational structures that already exist in those events take advantage of the audiences that those events already attract and theme them on human security for all and get the support of those organizations to help us explain what human security is, what it represents to the world, what it represents to their members and what it represents to their 
audience. Um, and uh, so the next one coming up, we've got two coming up in April. One is, uh, as Gary mentioned, the International Amateur Radio Union, which is uh, has ECOSOC status with the International Telecommunications Union. The ITU is the oldest um, agency of um, the UN. It's over 100 years old, and it uh, sets the regulatory framework for all of the countries of the world in the context of uh, communications and spectrum allocation. So uh, the International Amateur Radio Union represents 4 million amateur radio operators around the world in virtually every country and has about 150 country men member societies that are members of the IARU. So the IARU has, holds an annual event. Um, all the member societies participate in it, and uh, it has the potential to reach a large number of people who are technically minded and uh, own their own personal radio communication system. And so this year they've agreed to theme their um, World Amateur Radio Day around the concept of human security for all. So what does it mean when somebody themes it? Well, at CES, what it meant was they took responsibility for projecting the message. They took responsibility for explaining the seven dimensions of human security, um, environmental security, economic security, food security, health security, personal security, community security, and political security. And they took responsibility for showing how each one of those pillars of human security relates directly to the not just what the members' products and entrepreneurial activities are engaged in at this moment, but what they have to be aligned with in the future to be relevant to society and to society's aspirations, and also to align themselves not only with the societal aspirations, but with the emerging regulatory framework within which every business around the world has to operate. And alignment and resonance with those two primary um, um, frameworks are one of the keys in strategic planning within business organizations around the world and represent a way for businesses to plot um, their future. Um, you know, human security is a way for all of us to really kind of strategically map out what the future is going to look like because we know that individuals are pushing for these uh, human security needs to be addressed. And as they push for them to be addressed, certain markets are going to disappear, certain products are going to disappear, and new markets and new products are going to emerge. So that's how human security is relevant uh, to entrepreneurs and to businessmen. And I think that that came out very clearly in the Force for Good uh, report on technology, which I encourage all of you to, uh, to look up. Go to the Force for Good website and look at their reports and take a look at the report on technology as a force for good, it has a tremendous amount of extremely valuable information in it that, that tech companies are using to plot their future course of product development. Um, so the next uh, event after um, IRU is EarthX, which is coming up in Dallas um, in just 10 days. Um, and EarthX is the largest um, green gathering in the world. It attracts about 150,000 people. And many companies will also be there. So uh, following on the heels of uh, the WASP success at CTA, we hope to have a similar success at EarthX, where we'll be talking to 
businesses who are interested in um, in um, addressing what is emerging to be a new category of business opportunity, which is uh, green development. Um, so uh, those are a few of the things that we're involved in to project HS4A out into the world to make it real and not just some idea that's kicked around um, within uh, a, a confined group. And um, I hope I've, I've given you a little bit of a peek into that world. I think it's very exciting. I think it's a new development for WAS and a new development for the Human Security Unit. And those of us who are involved in it are um, are really um, really happy um, to be leveraging the reputation of WAS into this kind of an effort and to see the fruit of that effort. Uh, it's been uh, really gratifying. Thank you so much, Walt. I think you've said the right thing. Uh, those of us who participated in our whole team here were a part of the team uh, uh, that uh, that went to the CES show and participated in it. And I think we all came away energized and excited. Uh, what we didn't expect was that CTA would be <laughs> energized and excited. And when they got on the phone with us a month or two later and said they want to continue, uh, I think uh, I think we were pretty surprised by that uh, because and the thing that's really important about is they wanted to continue not for excitement. They wanted to continue to have impact. They wanted to take it beyond the first round and see how we could really change the thinking of the member companies in this industry. And by the way, they're, they're, you'll know a few of the names of the member companies like Google and Microsoft and Apple and uh, and Facebook and uh uh, and it goes on from there, Samsung and all. I mean, these were the leading technology companies in the world that were there and, and many at a lower level. Uh, we can't fully share the feeling we had, but I think for those of you who know the Academy, you'll you'll be able to see that we reached out beyond our traditional grazing grounds, let's say, and we're really out in the world and people are listening. And they're and they're motivated and they they're serious about this. They really want to do something. Uh, Walt and I were in a meeting with the president and four top six top executives of the uh, of CTA, and the president went around asking his executives what they you know what do they think about it and what they'd like to do. And every one of them, they were unanimous. We want to continue. You know, we can't stop here with a message. We've got to go to action. I'd like to try an experiment. We'll see if it works. But uh, for the CES show, we developed a 90-second video because we were afraid that we wouldn't have an opportunity to really project our message uh, in a in a, a show with 120,000. And these were not just the public. These were all business leaders and technology leaders. They all come there for business. They all come there for work. And the exhibition is so large, we were unsure that we would get anybody's attention. So we had our team make up a 90-second video that we would show in a few of the sessions that we were running. And the president of the association liked it so much that he showed it in his opening keynote address. And it was shown a few hundred, maybe 400 times for every meeting that took place in that uh, during that time so i'm going to try to show it to you it's just uh two two minutes okay, for human security 23 we're partnering with the united nations trust fund for human security and the world academy of art and science to support a campaign called the human security for all campaign and what that does is it shows how tech innovations can protect human securities, or as we actually call them, human rights. Think about it, what kind of human securities or rights should there be? And the ones that are there that, that they recognize and we're promoting are fundamental to just basic existence as humans. Clean air and clean water. Food, the right not to be hungry. 
health care. Everyone should be entitled to health care. Community engagement, political involvement. These are things which the United Nations and others have identified as saying these are basic human securities or rights. And the, and the, the great thing about them is technology can play a difference in making that happen. But first, let's take a closer look. For many people, today's world is insecure, full of threats on many fronts. Violent conflicts, natural disasters, persistent poverty, epidemics and economic downturns endanger peace, stability, and sustainable development. These threats are no longer isolated events limited to national borders. Their destruction travels the globe with great consequences on all societies. We cannot face these insecurities alone. We need to rise above our national and individual differences as one human family with human security for all. Human security is a people-centered view of what it means to be safe and secure. Faced with unprecedented challenges, the world requires urgent responses and innovative solutions. Next generation and human-centered technology carry the potential to reshape our future. Join us on a mission to bring human security for all through technology. Let us rise together to reach our potential and leave no one behind. That was before an audience of about 1,000 senior executives of the companies of the industry. But this, as I said, was repeated about 400 times before in meetings throughout the... Uh, uh, Jonathan, you wanted to? Yeah. Your... Um, yeah. So uh, I wanted to highlight and emphasize what, how the, the ripple effects of such an endeavor so the American Bar Association is having its International Law Sections Conference in New York next month, and the keynote speaker will be the person you just heard is the opening speaker. So, so he's going to be carrying that message to the cream of the international bar. Uh, the heads of all the major uh, bar associations of the world will be there, uh, and that will be the message. And then afterwards, I will have a dialogue with the head of NASDAQ, on, who I met at this conference, on the subject of basically addressing corruption and stopping illicit financial transactions, which from our, the perspective of uh, the Anti-Corruption Academy is the central necessary, necessary pillar of the SDGs, SDG 16, which addresses corruption and good governance. Without good governance, none of the SDGs are going to be fulfilled. And I also want to point out the, this integration of these issues and how human security is an integrating uh, concept, whereas each of the different SDGs are siloed. Um, the good governance is necessary, but if people don't have food security, you won't have good governance. Etc. If we don't address the climate, people are not going to have potable water. So we need an integrating concept, and it's evidence to us that human security is that effective integrating concept when you get an institution focused on technology at that level saying, yes, we get that. Now we have to start spreading that integrating message to larger constituencies and, 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 and hopefully advance the kind of human solidarity that's needed to get us through this multi-dimensional crisis of modernity. Great. Thank you so much, Jonathan, for adding that. Uh, and now I'd like to call on one of our other uh, distinguished fellows of the Academy, Whitold Kinsner, who has served for a very long time in probably the most distinguished technology organization in the world, IEEE, where he was the head of 
uh, on the board and the head of education for this organization of 500,000 plus uh, uh, technical experts in, in all fields. Witto, your comments. Thank you. Thank you. So, ladies and gentlemen, it is a privilege to see all your faces because you represent uh, that movement, that movement that was for me was always about security, humanity, and our existence beyond the foreseeable future. Uh, all of us have some sort of uh, grandchildren. It is not about us anymore, it's about them. They, they smiles and their minds participating in on, in it. When I heard about uh, Jonathan's uh, contributions and Walt's contributions recent in, in spreading the word, I would like to also assert that IEEE um, is a, p a place where technology is happening. I'm for, for one, uh, Chantel mentioned uh, the use of space for uh, to enhance security through practical means. I'm leading now um, a group of low Earth orbit satellites, uh, con consolidating all of it and moving computing into space. Those are realities that are ex exist too. But I think they're lacking that mean meaning. And Gary was, you provide that meaning of why it ought to be done sooner than later. Uh, the other component I want to mention that our organization has over 1800 conferences each year. Those are technical, deep technical conferences. Um, what we are lacking is that human, the purpose. The purpose in the past was be developing the best technology for whom? Um, there's a young young person who contributed tremendously of moving and adding that components technology for humanity. But humanity is still nebulous as aspect. What Gary and uh, was is bringing is that core, the existence. It is an exist existential component. The existence of us beyond <laughs> the foreseeable future. It is really the generations to come it's it's that is the beauty of it so i want to assure you that we are doing a lot it's a big organization it's not just one show it is it penetrates the different minds people who already many of them think that they know the answers <laughs> Um, we have to be joined together as gary always said join together all of us um and bring the diversity of thinking, because this is not something that can be answered in five minutes. It is such a deeply rooted, difficult subject that we all have to somewhat agree, not completely, how to do it. And it can be done. Just to tell you too, that uh, like Walt uh, put his effort, <laughs> I'm putting an effort in May, we have a workshop dedicated to Leo, satellite security <laughs> um, with specific aspects um, then it will be uh, will be an, another workshop with the major players in the in the field um, working in november so we are doing the bits and pieces together and the network or the net we have to capture all of those people and have to say this is what you always wanted to do. Now this is the time <laughs> and we can't wait another 10 years or even five or even three. This is today, this year. This is the critical component. And the last component that I want to add, the radio community, uh, Walt is smiling. Um, he's probably like me, a Morse code ham operator throughout the life. I give, give uh, courses um, to 60 people who come very apprehensive and then say, that's how I can help people. Uh, when everything fails, I, I'm still there. I have a briefcase that I can communicate with anybody around the globe through satellites at any time. So those are the things that we want to teach. We want to engage the people, not to be afraid of artificial intelligence, but use all of the tools that exist to help us humans who have hearts too, and conscience to achieve that goal. And the final component is that 
I feel that we have an army of people who are waiting for that call. Gary, I would like to uh, encourage you to reach all of the teachers. Teachers are the shapers of the future. Um, education, they know that education is existential. It's not education for one uh, life, uh, one job. It is not about the job in the first place because we, uh, all of the young people will have 10 jobs, minimum three jobs in a lifetime. So the Prussian model of educating for one job on an assembly line is gone. It was gone already with the first industrial revolution. We are now in the fifth and we are still using the old model. Teachers are eager to help in that process, but they're left alone, no money, no support because they have to deliver <laughs> a program, not education. So we have to shift and engage them and say, we are together with you. We can help you. By engaging the millions of, of teachers, I think we can accelerate the process a little bit more. So, uh, uh, Walt, we will connect one day on Morse code um, on five milliwatts. I communicate with New Zealand in five milliwatts. Uh, it cannot be done easily, as you probably know. Uh, and I live in the big country too, that is la surrounded by land, not uh, ocean. So things can be done. Marvelous things ha have been done, not can be done, have been done. And I feel that was is just a magnificent mechanism. The place, the meeting place, where not only minds meet, but hearts meet. Whenever I, I heard Jonathan talking, I heard the heart. Whenever you talk, I see the heart. I know that all of us have some skills. <laughs> some of them are extraordinary, but this does not matter. It is that heart, that care, and probably care is the most important word. So that's what I wanted to add to this beautiful story that you are, you are weaving today. Uh, but I have to leave for a course. I'm still teaching. My class is large. And today is my last class before the summary, before the exam. So, uh, um, and I can tell you, I'm not just telling you this. My heart is with the students. <laughs> My heart is with them because I know that one day we'll have to say, leave the ship, but they will have to carry it. They have to steer it in the better, better waters, avoid the troubles, avoid the, the lack of fertilizer, uh, avoid the, the, the need to uh, jack up all of the prices so everybody could die. So death versus life, <clears throat> life versus death. Uh, let's let's help in choosing, uh, and the choice is obvious, but it's so difficult. Uh, we tend to choose the former. Our life life is, however, what we want. So I thank you for for allowing me to to say it those few words. But uh, I see you as those uh, caretakers, those custodians of that heart and that care. Keep that with all of your abilities and your all of contacts. It is absolutely not only worthwhile, it is existential, existential, existential. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Withold. You're not only all heart, you're a born teacher. And uh, <laughs> that's what we love about you so much. Thank you. Thank and you I'd so much. And I just pick up on what you've said uh, because we haven't really covered that yet, but you know it. Uh, just last month, WAS conducted in support of HS4A, uh, the sixth future education conference since 2013. And this one was on education for human security. And we tried something new this time. We gathered together 120 speakers covering all the disciplines pretty much spread out with representatives from business and technology and finance and the arts and cinema 
uh, and psychology and anthropology, we economy, ecology, we covered them all. And we asked everybody one question. What is your discipline doing to promote the human security uh, of the people on Earth? Or rather, what more can you be doing? Uh, and not just to look at GDP growth, <laughs> or not just to look at uh, uh, addressing climate, which is so important, uh, or uh, making profits in business. But what can you teach the next generation of leaders and experts and, uh, and entrepreneurs and scientists and teachers <laughs> as to what we need to know, what the next generation needs to know, and lawyers, I shouldn't leave Jonathan's <laughs> important constituency out. What should everybody know and understand and in order to contribute to addressing the global human security issues that we face? And we had a, a, a extremely positive feedback from the participants uh, in the conference. We're now preparing a book, a major publication, uh, to go to one of the big publishers like Springer to widely distribute the papers and ideas. We've already been asked by our UN colleagues to prepare a briefing note on the conclusions of the conference, the essential conclusions to be presented before an SDG working group, uh, either this coming early next month or uh, two months later. So the UN is asking us what came out of this and we're processing the material day and night. I had a call from our Secretary General Janani Ramanathan today. She listened to one session uh, today and she found so much good content in it. She said, this is enough for one session. We had 26. This was enough to write the report just from one session. She was overflowing with enthusiasm. So I wanna stress, this is part of a movement. We're not just here to talk to one another. We're trying to talk to the world, engage the world. And we find people are listening and resonating uh, with what they're hearing. But just last week, we had an extraordinary meeting with our partners from the Human Security Unit and the IPU, which is the Interparliamentary Union, which is an organization, an international governmental organization. It's not the UN. It's owned or controlled by 170 countries who are whose parliaments are official members of the organization. It's an organization of member states that want to in, collaborate with each other to improve the way parliamentary democracy works, lawmaking works, policy formulation and policy implementation. And IPU has agreed that, they, that they're taking human security as one of the main themes for the next two years and they're working with us to develop briefing papers, concrete practical briefing papers with case studies to what parliamentarians need to know in order to take this approach and ap apply it practically at the national level and at the community level down below. And the UN has 20 years of experience in doing this in 300 uh, projects around the world, but it's the first time that they'll be working directly with parliaments on how do we take this message and get it down. So again, each of these groups, each of these uh, partners, collaborators is dealing with a whole different constituency of, uh, of global society. And we're working with each of them to try to find out how they can take this message and personalize it in their field uh, and for their people uh, as they go through. And just two days ago, I had a, a visit with one of our speakers from the, uh, the, the education conference who's dealing with 10,000 schools in India and Asia. And he runs every year a film festival for schools which is actually with a hundred films, which are actually projected in the schools. They don't have to come to a central location uh, anywhere in the world for them. 
Uh, he has about 10 million students uh, who participate. And these films are created by students on themes. And he has agreed that for the next film festival, he's going to ask the students and give awards for students who can make short videos on the themes of human security, what it means to them, and how those needs have to be met uh, as they go forward. So this just gives you a little bit of an idea of where WAS is going and where we want you to help us in your areas, in your connections, whether it's in a university uh, or in government or uh, in, in a research institute, so that we can explore how for each sector of the society, we can make this message uh, more practically real for implementation and get it out further. Uh, Jonathan, I'd like to ask you a question because I, I, you, I've heard a very good answers from you on this before. Uh, you know, some people say, what's the idea of talking about human security? I thought we're all environmentally sensitive now. We got a planet to take care of. We got nature to take care of. Uh, and what's, what's in your understanding of the relationship between the security of people and the security of our planet and the life on our planet and the health of our planet? <clears throat> well, I'm informed on that subject by a... I know you are. Uh, now go. you how's that okay. yeah that's great i'm informed on this subject by a dialogue that i did with the oxford union debates with jane goodall who has some degree of understanding of the web of life and the importance of where the human species and the dangers of anthropomorphic limitations in our thinking and i totally agree with her which is that our approach should be that for humans to have security, the entire web of life has to be protected. We're but one thread in the web of life. And we don't know, we don't know where the tipping point is in biodiversity's endangerment. I'll just give one example that I often use in trying to explain human security. I just addressed a, a university, entire university on the subject. And I asked the students to remember that 60 to 80 percent of their oxygen comes from phytoplankton, which depends on the health of the oceans. That if any one of us lost a lung, we could live, but if we lose that third lung, we all as a species end. It's that serious. And the phytoplankton depends on the health and the pH balance of the oceans which we are endangering by virtue of melting the polar ice cap as well as dumping in the oceans. And the reason that we're doing that is because we are privileging an economic order that advances the burning of fossil fuel, which is affecting the climate. And you can't address the burning of fossil fuel without addressing the economic system. And if we don't address the economic system, we will destroy the health of the oceans. If we destroy the health of the oceans, we will destroy the human species. So these issues of interspecies interdependence goes right to the very breath of every day and the economic system that we have. So UNDP, the United Nations Program for Development, did a terrific report last year called um, uh, Threats to human security in the Anthropocene, a call for greater solidarity. And they nailed it, which is the Anthropocene is the over, overreach of the human species impact on the regenerative processes of nature, that we are affecting nature in ways that are unsustainable. And that UNDP focused on the need for the ought, the ought, the compass point, of solidarity and that's precisely the interconnectedness and it's not just solidarity amongst peoples but it's as the secretary general recently said stopping the war against nature and so i think it's central to to our message that there's no human security without the humans understanding our relationship to the to the to the whole that that's central to the entire messaging um, I, I would I would only add that um, the integrating the science 
progresses when there's integrating principles that can be used across all the sciences. And, po and politics is the same way. We, you know, we, the, the, that we are lacking any integrating principles that allow coordinated efforts. So the efforts of states to pursue security has now become disconnected from protecting people. And I would just focus on nuclear weapons as the perfect example, which has now become so absurd in both the amount of money expended, but in the proposition that the more we perfect the weapon, the less security we get. And it's because our definition of what is success in security is simply the wrong bus. It's based on a Roman fifth century maxim, prepare for war, receive peace, prepare for peace, receive war. So the excesses that arise in the preparation for war actually become adverse to security. And, and, and that's why the, an idea at this point is not simply uh, poetry or political rhetoric. It is as powerful as the idea in the 17th century that to get out of the religious wars of Central Europe, the idea of the nation state took hold and, and, and certainly had benefits, pulled us out of those wars. But then it led to several hundred years of European wars until there was a higher level of integration, the European Union. And now we're facing a similar global crisis where we need integrating principles. And human security is exactly that. That's, what it's, that's why the idea is powerful and ideas matter because consciousness matters. And, the, and when people say, oh, it's idealistic, um, no, it's, it's really realistic. It acknowledges that we cannot ignore science in favor of national ideology. That is unrealistic. Those so-called realists argue that the status quo doesn't need to be changed. And that oh, everybody on this call knows that the status quo is unsustainable. And the world is looking for a compass to get out of the status quo, a compass for change that we can all join in. And that's what we're proposing. That's the framework of the debate. What's, what are ideas that can bring us to, that can meet the issue that UNDP says, a call for greater solidarity? Thank you, Jonathan. Very inspiring. You know, I just wanted to stress that our, as an academy, you all know, you have, especially those of you who are on the board, you know, we're a small organization with limited personal resources. What we've got is some dedicated people who belong to global networks. And the strength of the academy is that we're not trying to be something in ourselves. We're trying to reach out uh, to the larger networks around and mobilize support from them. And that's what you've been hearing uh, from our examples. We consider each of our members, each of our fellows is the center of a network that can lead us to new opportunities. It was, it was Walt who, as he told the story, the, the whole of the uh, consumer electronics industry came because of one person's contact that he had a, a, a in it. And uh, uh, I'd like to, and we have, we have many other, many other t things we have to do and such. One of them that I haven't mentioned yet, which is an important program of the Academy, is our research with base is our work with basic science researchers and asking them to reflect on and attune to and direct their work, just like the technology people, more and more for emphasis on uh, human impact on human security. And I'd like to ask uh, Alexander Zydeshek to just say a few words. You were at the the meeting in uh, September that uh, Nabosha organized with UNESCO. And we're organizing, it's, it's part of a much bigger program. And now we're going to be planning a, a, a webinar pretty soon, uh, as you know about that, as a follow up to that, uh, because this is something that we can do in every field. And we need the active participation of our fellows, whatever your contacts are, just as you have done this wonderful webinar, 
uh, to give us an opportunity to share who or else we can be connected with. And the National Academies are a very big uh, potential for us. Uh, uh, if we can work with uh, IAP, for example, the Inter-Academy Partnership of which we're a fellow and a member, we had talked to them two years ago about this. How do we engage the other national academies to get this message and think about it uh, in their own research, the way uh, uh, Whitold Kinsner was saying? Uh, Sandy, would you like to say something? Uh, thank you, Gary. First, congratulations on this uh, wonderful event and uh, on great progress of this initiative on human security for all. It's really the high time that we do some really massive progress. And as also, uh, as you mentioned, uh, there were some great uh, contributions uh, already at the Belgrade conference. There was another conference, now a webinar. And uh, here we have a lot of scientists from all over the world who are really passionate about bringing the human security, you know, in the times that are today are really extraordinary times. But the most extraordinary thing in these times is that time is actually shrinking faster and faster, which means that everything is going on so fast that we don't really have a lot of time to think and to stop. But uh, it's really time to, to act. And uh, on one hand, uh, I think uh, these connections to uh, academies, to the Club of Rome, to the national associations for the Club of Rome. So for example, we are now just helping in Bosnia to establish a new association, which will also be a great uh, uh, contributor to the peace, especially since this is a region which is not uh, so peaceful, or at least it was not so peaceful recently, and it still has some many challenges. Uh, so uh, I believe that those small in initiatives, not, not really small, but pointed to the those really most dangerous uh, issues that are facing humanity at the moment are going to make the, the largest contribution. And uh, there was also a talk earlier about education. Actually, basic sciences are actually contributing to education the most because uh, people who are doing research in basic science are also professors. So we have like some great students and uh, I know last week we had some really nice seminars of these students. We are trying to direct these students uh, to focus on how can they contribute to the sustainability, to security, their own personal development so that the world is getting better because of uh, what they are doing. And I can see really great uh, uh, improvement in self-confidence in these students. So like uh, there was a student who, who came like on Friday and uh, he was really... Uh, 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 developed some vision and with our, our help uh, he improved it so so i believe that uh, this is actually the way one person at a time bring them into uh, into the uh, world of basic sciences which are actually designing the basic knowledge but which is then being applied all over the world all over the globe and each of those uh, people who are contributed to the knowledge are actually contribute the lives of all 8 billion people around the world which which can now benefit from the research faster than ever and maybe there is one very important point i need to talk about uh, this is this advantage of uh, artificial intelligence revolution uh, for example, we can see with the students already, uh, there are some seminars where parts are like written not by students, but by computers. But so far, we still have the ability to, to notice this, to find out. Uh, uh, I mean, this is not, this is an excess. But then there are also so many great tools which you can use for the benefit of humanity that the computer and the machines are helping you to do, to produce better results and uh, to do some good uh, and uh, uh, multiply actually what you're doing in a, in a great way so this chat gpt is just the top of the iceberg there are lots of applications that are going on they're being developed and i believe that also within our project we need to take the full advantage of the this upcoming applications which are going to appear this year, next year, a lot of them which are going to help in these different aspects both of human security of basic sciences and of education and uh, this is kind of a leapfrogging, you know, uh, when instead of reaching one person at a time, you leapfrog all over that and then suddenly reach everybody uh, on the planet, which which is actually uh, being possible or will be possible in a very, very near future, which is much closer than we believe. And uh, uh, and therefore, well, there are actually two events that we plan in Ljubljana in September. We plan an Erasmus event on systematic competence development, because here, if we as humans want to stay on top of the game with all this artificial intelligence, we need better competency that we used to have uh, last year or 
previous years which and we also must share this so that everybody can develop this better company stay on top of the game so that the artificial intelligence will help us but not uh, uh cause us troubles like uh it uh, very often did uh, so this is this is one issue and the other issue is there is also this, this Davis conference sustainable development of energy water environment systems in Dubrovnik uh, the beautiful Adriatic city a historic ancient which will be in September around September 26 and there we also plan an event on human security for all in the context of sustainable future uh, with active participation of was and this is also a great opportunity uh, to share the knowledge of the and the results of uh, our uh, was project on human security for all so i believe this these two are going to be really very very good opportunities to spread the knowledge uh all all over the world i mean the davis conference it usually has seven eight hundred people from all five continents which means this is an easy way to spread the knowledge all over the globe and um and I believe uh, for the end, uh, it would also be my last point is that it's important uh, that we are aware what is going on in the world, that the computers are almost getting smart. They are not yet smart, but every year they are getting better. Uh, so we need to be ca very careful also about uh, when, when we talk about security, also cyber security is extremely important uh, so that we know that what we do is protected and that the computers are not kind of oversmarting or some people who are behind those computers. So at the moment, it's still... Uh, a human being behind but uh, but if the human being is like using uh, great algorithms and doesn't have good intentions in mind that can be really dangerous so this is some aspect which we all together as humanity need to address and to improve and i believe this would be a great challenge for the months to come and to look forward to the following events so and i also wish you uh, great luck uh, with the continuing of this event uh, which uh, which is really at the right time in the right place thank you Thank you, Sandy. And we do we we not only want the luck, we want all your full act continued support, which you're doing. And Southeast Europe is doing a great job of supporting us, as is uh, Latin America now with the with this event. Thank you so much. We Thank just you. have about five minutes left, and I'd like to give each of our uh, panelists a minute or two to say anything else that uh, they would like to add to the discussion. And I just throw out a hint, but I leave it to you. Uh, uh, all three of you shared sessions at the education conference, in very interesting sessions, looking at uh, what uh, could be done with the idea of human security in modifying education in a different field. Uh, for Chantalin, it was economy, I think, right? Uh, and uh, Walt, it was business. And Jonathan, it was law, and they were fascinating discussions. I heard them all. Uh, you, if there's something else more pressing in your mind, okay. But otherwise, share any insights you had or something you'd like to see us take back in our briefing note uh, that stood out for you. Uh, I'll just hear the other two, Jonathan, and end with you since I haven't heard quite as much from them. Chantalin? Thank you, Gary, and thank you, everyone. Very interesting. I guess. Just to, to get back to what you were mentioning in the economy session, the whole idea that, um, you know, everybody thinks of the UN as, you know, taking humanitarian um, uh, approach, and that's what they know. But really, to solve this problem, it's through the market. <laughs> we're going to solve this problem through the market by changing our economic model and around it, the, inter the, the trade, the financial system, um, and the, the way our market work and the way we measure progress. That's the way we're going to solve this problem. We saw the drying out of international aid um, over the last few years. So countries cannot depend on international aid. They need to depend on themselves on at the regional at the national level, regional level, the international community in terms of, of technology, in terms of, of, but we need to review our markets, our, our market work. And this is why I think, um, and I've already mentioned that to you and somebody else mentioned that the uh, going back to students um, and professors. So I wrote an article on new economics for sustainable development for the university network. Uh, asking, uh, challenging millions of students around the world to write business model that support these new economics for sustainable development. Right. And I really think we could use that as a model for human security. Over. Thank you, Shantanu. Walt. 
you'd like to add to the discussion okay well, that or something else uh, first i'd like to people. say i really enjoyed Wittal's uh comments and yeah. xander it's nice to see you again and your comments were really appreciated also um i yes uh our session was on business and it was a really interesting session and um but but lately i've been thinking a lot about economic security and which ties into the session that we did and ties into HS4A quite well. And it's clear based on things that have happened in the global economy in the last few months that as far as business people are concerned, there's an economic security uh, problem that needs to be addressed as well. We think about economic security being something that the poor are really focused on um, and, and, uh, and they are and we should be. Um, but I think it, I would be remiss if I didn't point out that we need a healthy um, uh, environment, a healthy, uh, let's say, climate for entrepreneurial activity. If we're going to address uh, the gaps in the SDGs that we talked about earlier and have uh, technology move forward at the pace we really need it to move forward at in order to address some of these problems. And um, and I think that the recent financial problems uh, that have come to light, the banking uh, failures in the United States, uh, the dramatic um, impact that the decline in bond values has had on uh, global uh, the value of global debt and the ability for um, developing countries to refinance their debt. Um, the impact that that has on um, on entrepreneurship and on creating a, a obstacles and a negative environment for entrepreneurial activity. I think these things all point out uh, to me um, that economic security is something that is a very essential part of having a healthy human security environment. Great. Thank you, Walt. Jonathan. Well, you know, this is very Latin American focused, I understand. And so I was thinking about Latin America. One of the most important things that you that you have to re that anyone should recognize in Latin America is it of all the regions of the world, it has the lowest level of interstate conflict, states in conflict with each other. It's not it's not uh it should not be ignored that uh, Latin America, because of the Treaty of Tlatelolco, was the first nuclear weapons free zone that stopped nuclear arms racing between Brazil and Argentina. On the other hand, on the other hand, at a domestic level, in, especially in the urban areas of Latin America, Rio, Mexico City, etc., at the highest level of gun related violence. So. So there's some disconnect here that is plaguing the region. There's uh, a need, a need for some form of integrating principles that transcend right, left, socialism, free market capitalism, and all of the ideological differences that have created very, very toxic domestic conflicts within Latin America. And I say, I say this as an American, seeing how toxic ideological differences can bring to a grinding halt domestic social progress. I bemoan and, 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 and cry over the fact that my country is now subjected to a challenging ideology that would bring us to a completely stratified, um, un unjust society. For that reason, Latin America, in my opinion, could be a place where human security as a concept could be most powerful because at a macro level amongst nations, there has been a recognition of the need for 
a common security approach and arms racing has been curtailed. And that's, that is laudable. So I would urge as a strategic, you know, to play to, play to strengths, build from strengths, and there is strength there. And it's to some extent, you know, it's, it's window dressing to some, but to others like myself, it's very important. The collective statements that have come out of CELAC as distinguished from the uh, Organization of American States, the CELAC statements have been outstanding. And it would seem to me that it would be worth an effort to try and get CELAC to put human security in its next statement as a central theme, that that would be a strategy worth, worth pursuing. And hopefully it could filter into the domestic political discourse that might overcome the toxic partisan problems that plague the region and now plague the United States as well. Great. Thank you, Jonathan. Uh, and I'd like to just turn it back to you, Saulo, by our thanks that you have given us this opportunity to share our thoughts and experiences. And please accept our open invitation uh, uh, to all our friends and fellows in Latin America to join us. Uh, we need all the help we can get. Yes, we are grateful. The discussions and the ideas that we reached our mind and uh, we received a lot of thoughts that can help us to to manage our our actions uh, toward the human security uh, better stage. And I agree with uh, Granoff. Uh, we have an uh, internal war here in Latin America, dear Jonathan, the the difference uh, between classes and the uh, inequality, the violence, the human violence, it's, it's, it's true. And uh, we need to improve, we need to acquire better levels of uh, human security, uh, no doubt about it. Here we have a lot to work to that. We have to be aware about the situation, the, 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 what you have to do, what you have to do to change the, and modify the reality. Uh, we, we, we have to be aware about it. 